Revelation chapter 16, reading from the ESV, this is what it says. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple telling the seven angels, go and pour out on the earth the seven bowls of the wrath of God. So the first angel went and poured out his bowl on the earth, and harmful and painful sores came upon the people who bore the mark of the beast and worshipped its image. The second angel poured out his bowl onto the sea, and it became like the blood of a corpse, and every living thing died that was in the sea. The third angel poured out his bowl into the rivers and the springs of water, and they became blood. And I heard the angel in charge of the water say this, Just are you, O Holy One, who is and who was, for you have brought these judgments, for they have shed the blood of the saints and the prophets, and you have given them blood to drink. It is what they deserve. And I heard the altar saying, Yes, Lord God the Almighty, true and just are your judgments. The fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and it was allowed to scorch people with fire. They were scorched by the fierce heat, and they cursed the name of God who had power over these plagues. They did not repent and give him glory. The fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and its kingdom was plunged into darkness. People gnawed their tongues in anguish and cursed the God of heaven for their pain and sores, and they did not repent of their deeds. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up to prepare the way for the king's from the east. And I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet, three unclean spirits like frogs. For they are demonic spirits performing to the kings of the whole world who assemble them for the great battle on the great day of God. is the one who stays awake, keeping his garments on, that he may not go about naked and be seen exposed. And they assembled them at the place in Hebrew that is called Armageddon. The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the Flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, And a great earthquake, such as had never been seen since man was on the earth. So great was that earthquake. The great city was split into three parts. And the cities of the nations fell. And God remembered Babylon the great to make her drain the cup of the wine of the fury of his wrath. And every island fled away and no mountains were to be found. And great hailstones, about 100 pounds each, fell from heaven on people, and they cursed God for the plague of the hail because the plague was so severe. This is God's word for us this morning. We're going to pray, and we're going to ask that he's going to speak to us through it. Um, let's, let's bow in a word of prayer. Jesus, we thank you. Um, you are awesome. You are great. Your word we hold above us right now. Lord, we hold it above us because we want to hear from you. We want you to be able to speak to us. We want, God, your words to pierce our hearts, convict us, lead us, draw us to repentance this morning. We pray, God, that through this word that we've heard, God, that we would see you as great and awesome and mighty and worthy of our praise. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So today we are looking at God's wrath being poured out on the ungodly. And as we look at these bowls, We see an intensification of God's judgment on the ungodly. Now, I have something to confess to you. This has been a really hard week, and I guess maybe I say that every week, but this has been a hard week, especially in trying to understand this passage. I'll tell you why. I really wanted to take a different route this morning. I wanted to take a less costly route um, in preaching this passage here. In our study of Revelation, I'll, I'll, I'll be honest, and, and I'm, I'm a pastor, you know, it, it just goes to show my frailties, my weaknesses too, that God is still working in my life. Um, in our study of Revelation, I, I've grown weary of the talk of wrath and judgment and anger uh, and all those things. It, it's something that wears on you, right? Um, it's just kind of like that rain cloud over top of you. And, and I've been wrestling with God about this all week. I, I've, been, I've been fighting, I've been kicking against the goad, so to speak, to use a biblical term. And uh, <clears throat> Friday night, after I wrote, 
one of many drafts of a sermon in, in preparing for you this morning after I was talking with my wife about the passage. And, and I have to say, I'm really thankful for a godly wife who corrects me, who challenges me, who, who, who is able to talk with me and walk with me through these things. God has blessed me through her. So I'm, I'm thankful for her. She's not just... Thank you, yes. <clears throat> Pastors' wives, honestly, it is definitely a calling, just as much as being a pastor, I have to say. Um, so I, I want to encourage you, and I'm not just saying this selfishly, but be praying for Kelsey, be praying for Krista, and I want to us to continue to pray for those who are pastors and their wives as well. It is definitely a calling. It is not just something that they get dragged into. So let's, uh, let's be praying for them. But anyways, as getting back to what I was saying, I, I'm, I'm thankful um, God has, has used my wife to be able to challenge me in how I was approaching this text that I'm looking at here this morning. And she challenged me by seeing this. I do not have a proper understanding of the wrath of God. I feared preaching about it today. And for reasons really that just pertain to my own selfishness, my own stubbornness, and really my own desire to be liked. Because it's not easy to talk about judgment. It is not easy to talk about things that are in, in this day and age very real, very true. And what the Bible talks about, it, it scrapes away at this sinful core within myself. But here's the thing, and I, and I realize as I study it, if I really hold God's word above as I claim to, I'm going to let it direct me instead of me trying to direct it. That's what I want God's word to do for us this morning. And understanding God's wrath this morning is just as crucial, get this, it's just as crucial in understanding God as understanding God's love. Just as crucial. I want to read to you this morning something that just floored me um, by the theologian J.I. Packer. I don't know if you've heard of him before. He's got this great book called Knowing God. Uh, I haven't read it. I'll be honest, I haven't read it, but I would like to read it. I'm looking forward to reading it. But there's a, passage, there's a part in this book that, I really, that really struck me as I was looking at what the wrath of God, he's got a chapter on the wrath of God. And I'm going to read it. it. It might be somewhat lengthy, but I'm going to just, I'm just going to barrel through it. And I'm going to try and make it so that you can understand it. This is what it says concerning the wrath of God. The root cause of our unhappiness towards the wrath of God seems to be a disquieting suspicion that ideas of wrath are in one way or another unworthy of God. It's not like God to be angry. To some, for instance, wrath suggests a loss of self-control, an outburst of seeing red, which is partially or partly, if not wholly, irrational. You ever get angry and just fly off the cuff and you're just irrational? You're not thinking clearly, you're just lashing out? That is how we perceive God's wrath. To others, it suggests a rage of conscious impotence or wounded pride or just a plain bad temper. Surely it is said it would be wrong to ascribe to God such attitudes, at, attitudes as these. It would be wrong for us to see God in this light. And the reply is this, indeed it would, but the Bible does not ask us to do this. There seems to be a misunderstanding here of the human characteristics in the language of Scripture towards God. That is, the biblical habit of describing God's attitudes and affections in terms ordinarily used for talking about man. The basis of this habit is the fact that God made man in his own image so that human personality and character are more like the being of God than anything else we know. But when scripture speaks of God anthropomorphically, that just basically means God has human characteristics, or more so, we have God-like characteristics in the sense that we feel, we hurt, we get angry, things like that. It does not imply that the limitations and imperfections which belong to the personal characteristics of us sinful creatures belong also to the corresponding qualities of our holy creator. Rather, it takes for granted that they do not get this. Thus, God's love, as the Bible views it, never leads him to foolish, impulsive, immoral actions in the same way that human love does. Right? And in the same way, God's wrath in the Bible is never the capricious, self-indulgent, irritable, more morally ignoble thing that human anger so often is. 
It is instead a right and necessary reaction to objective moral evil. God is only angry where anger is called for. Even among men, there is such a thing. There is such a thing as righteous indignation. That means righteous anger, right? The Bible talks about this. Righteous anger, anger over sin. When we see people walking in sin, that should make us angry. That should make us angry. Not that we are calling out people, not that we're going and trying to bash them over the head with our Bibles, but rather that that we see what that sin is doing to them and it makes us angry. We long to see them changed. We long to see them come back to who Jesus has created them to be. Though it is perhaps rarely found, but all God's indignation is righteous. Would a God who took as much pleasure in and as much pleasure in evil as he did in good be a good God? Would a God who did not react adversely to evil in his word be morally perfect? Surely not. But it is precisely this adverse reaction to evil, which is a necessary part of moral perfection that the Bible has in view when it speaks of God's wrath. That's what we are going to see today. We're going to see God's wrath. And it's tough, and it's hard for us to understand because all we know of wrath was that person who flew off the handle, that person who was just, has a bad temper, who has pride. That does not define or describe the God that we worship and serve. He is angry for all the right reasons. He's angry for all the right reasons. And it is my hope today that as we study God's word together, we will be right, we will be brought not only to the proper understanding of God's wrath towards sinners, but also proper understanding of his love towards those whom he's saved. As we look at God's wrath and we see how, how, how it is perfect, how it is not prone to weakness like our anger is, and we, we should also be just drawn to amazement and seeing about how God's love is just perfect. His perfect love, and it casts out all fear, as God's word says. God's love should amaze us just as much as his wrath. Now, as we look at the text today, I had to give that little precursor. What's helpful for us to understand the the text today is there's a common theme in Revelation. There's this common theme that we see. John, when he's writing the, the things that he sees in the visions of Revelation, he describes two groups of people, two types of people. And the Bible it's not is not itself um the Bible itself does this. The common theme in Revelation is that we see two groups of people, those who follow Jesus, the the church or the saints, as referred to in Revelation, and those who do not. And in Revelation, we read of they're they're called the people of the earth or earth dwellers in Revelation. That's the language because they basically, and it rightly uh, describes who they are because they've made the earth their final destination, their home. They've made their life all about what they get in the here and now. And as Christians, we make our life not just about about here and now and what God is doing in us here and now, but we are excited for his kingdom come into all eternity. This is a significant distinction between the two groups. And today, there's one characteristic that I want us to look at today as found in this passage from our text today. And the, the characteristic is this, repentance repentance. This is what we're going to see as a defining characteristic between these two, two groups. Now, you can look at the church and you can look at people who call themselves saints. And are they perfect? No. Sin still plagues us as the saints that God calls us to. And sin still plagues this world. So we are all sinful. But what's the major difference? We are called Jesus. And absolutely. Absolutely. Jesus draws us to repentance. Jesus draws us to repentance. And in Revelation 16, what appears to be a significant characteristic that defines those whom God is punishing, whom God's wrath is poured out on, is this, that they are unrepentant. We read it numerous times. They are unrepentant. I wish to show you today how the slippery slope of stubbornness against repenting, being unrepentant, leads us down the path which ends ultimately in God's wrath. And in turn, it, let's emphasize why repentance is so important in the life of the believer. Now, 
You may think of repentance as being something of just being sorry for yourself and getting down yourself. And you're like, man, I'm, this is going to be great. I'm already feeling amazing about myself. And now Josh is going to come here and talk to you about repentance. Let me just try and squash that. Repentance, let me just say, is not just and is so much more than saying I'm sorry. In fact, I would even go as far to say that repentance defines all of the life of the believer. Martin Luther, the man who ushered in the great Protestant Reformation, when he nailed his 95 thesis, and I'm not expecting you to understand necessarily what that is, but he he nailed a sheet of paper in which he went against the theologies that were being practiced in that day, and he, he tried to proclaim what he believed was written in the Bible. When he, when he nailed those 95 theses to the cathedral at Wittenberg in <clears throat> a long time ago, this is what some of the first words that was said in this 95 theses. He said, our Lord and Master Jesus Christ willed the entire life of believers to be one of repentance. The entire life of believers to be one of repentance. It's not just about saying sorry once. It's not just about saying, sorry, Jesus, I I sinned, and great, Jesus saved me, and I go about my merry way. Repentance is to become our very lives. So much so, I I can't emphasize this enough. John the Baptist, when he was preaching, when we first hear John the Baptist in the book of Matthew, what's his message to the Pharisees? Repent. And then, You know, Jesus comes along after John is put into prison. And, you know, it'd be very easy for Jesus, you know, it'd be the way we think about Jesus sometimes, it'd be very easy for us to think, well, you know, Jesus is here. He's kind of going to, don't listen to that guy. You know, he lived in the desert, ate grasshoppers for a living. Don't, Don't listen to that guy. I've got a different story for you. I've got something. No, his message was the exact same. It's the first words that we hear that Jesus preached from his mouth is, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. So first of all, let's look at what happens when we are unrepentant. And this will give us a healthy perspective in understanding what true repentance is. And sadly enough, I have to use the word true in front of repentance because it's a word that just gets mangled and just gets twisted and thrown around. So true repentance is what we're aiming for here today. First of all, when we are unrepentant, when we are unrepentant, we are carried off by idolatry. Let's look at verse 2. Revelation 16, verse 2. So the first angel went and poured out his bowl on the earth, and harmful and painful sores came upon the people who bore the mark of the beast and worshipped its image. And worshipped its image. Now, in this passage, it's easy to take things literally and think of physical, actual sores coming upon people. That very well could be. But it very well could be significant as well, talking about spiritual sores, talking about emotional sores, things like that. And, and what I really want to highlight in this verse here today is that these people worshipped the beast. And in, in Revelation, the beast is commonly referred to as the world systems of those, that day. Now, we're all familiar with idolatry, Right? We've, we've preached about it enough here, but, but we, and we continue to preach about it. In Exodus 20, G, God himself says, first commandment, you will have no other gods before me. This is the core of all of our sin right there. We have taken God down from the place that he should be in our lives, and we've put something else up in its place. It might be kids, it might be our spouse, it might be uh, our lust, it might be our, our money, it might be our jobs. Whatever it might be, it might be Facebook, right? Some of us live for Facebook, right? As silly as it may sound, but it's very real to some other people, right? Our sin starts at the core. Our sin starts with this root of idolatry that we are trying to serve something else other than God. And we put greater value on the things that God created than on God himself. That takes all of our time, talent, and treasure. And these people we read about here are carried off by idolatry. They worship the beast. They worship this worldly system, whatever it might be, that they take God down from the place that he should be and they put something else up there. And when that takes root in our lives and we are not repentant over it, 
when we are not seeking to go- let God pull that out of us, it gets ugly. It gets ugly. We're carried off by the next thing. We are constantly looking to be fulfilled by things and not the one true God. And secondly, idolatry, when we're carried off by idolatry, leads to rebellion against God. Look at verses 3 and 4, and then I'm also going to jump down to verse 6. This is what it says in verses 3 and 4. I'm just going to highlight the parts there. It says, the sea became like the blood of a corpse. And in verse 4, the rivers and the springs of water became blood. And then in verse 6, it says, for they have shed the blood of the saints and the prophets, and you have given them blood to drink. Now, what's, what's going on in this passage here? These people who have refused to make God their God, these people who are, are chasing after idols, have con- not only said, I don't need you, God, but they are actually willfully offending God, coming against him, coming against his people. In this passage, what it says there is that they killed the saints. They killed God's people. When idolatry, when, think about it, when idolatry takes root in our lives, When we love something more than God, we will defend that violently sometimes, right? God, don't ask me to give that, don't ask me to give that up. God, don't you dare take that from me. I will hate you, right? Idolatry, when it takes root, leads to rebellion against God. These people who had allowed idolatry to take root in their lives are now going against God. They're not only saying, God, I don't need you. They're saying, God, I want to get rid of you. I want to get rid of your your word. I want to get rid of your church. I want to get rid of people who follow you. I just don't want to hear it. That's what happens when we're unrepentant, right? We defend violently these things. Think about it this way. Here's an example. A thief, someone who's a thief, their idol is stuff or money. It's stuff or money. That's the thing that they want. They got to have it. They're willing to break the law to get what they want. It's their God. I have more stuff. I got to have more stuff to make myself feel fulfilled. These thieves are not thankful for what God has given them. So what they say is, I'm going to take what he has given to someone else. Catch that? What God has given me, I, I, God, it's not enough. It's not enough. But look what you gave in that person. How dare you give that person more money than me? How dare you give that person uh, that nice car? I'm going to go take that for myself. It is active rebellion against God. And, and you can insert anything in there. Bitterness, lust, You can insert all those things in there. All of them come back to the fact that when we let it take root in our lives, we will ultimately be offending God. And thirdly, when we seek to, when idolatry leads to rebellion against God, we become blind, blinded to God's justice. Look at verses five and seven. It says, just are you, O holy one, who is and who was, for you brought these judgments. Yes, Lord God, the almighty, true and just are your judgments. Idolatry that leads to rebellion, that leads us offended when God punishes us, when God tries to take those things from us, when we suffer maybe financially, when we, when we lose that person in our lives that we can't live without. When God, in his goodness, and the Bible talks about this, God corrects those whom he loves. When those things happen to us, if we are unrepentant, we just look at God and say, you have absolutely no right to do that to me. You have absolutely no right to put me through that. God is not just, he's just mean. An improper view of the gravity of our sin leads to an improper view to the holiness and perfection and righteousness of God. Verses 5 to 7 
it goes completely against that and says, God is completely just in his, all his actions towards us. He's completely justified when he brings punishment down on us. He's completely justified in his perfection, in his holiness, in his wisdom. He's completely justified. But we don't see it that way. Maybe we need to check our hearts. Maybe we need to see where we stand with God. And then it leads to this. Our suffering does not produce change. Our suffering does not produce change. Highlight verses 8 to 11. This is what it says. They cursed the name of God who had, give, who had power over these plagues. They did not repent and give him glory. And it goes on to say in verse 11, people gnawed their tongues or verse 10, sorry, people gnawed their tongues in anguish and cursed the God of heaven for their pain and sores. They did not repent of their deeds. Now, here's the true fact. There is suffering in this world for both the sinner and the saved alike, the sinner and the saint. There is suffering, right? We read about it in Matthew chapter 5, verse 45. It says that God brings sun and rain on both the righteous and the unrighteous, right? Right? It's, it's, it's happens. God does this. He's not, he's not showing partiality in a sense to, to bring those things upon us. And we do suffer. There are things, there are times things are taken from us, but here's the thing that makes us different. Here's where the, the dichotomy is between someone who follows Jesus and someone who doesn't. Someone who doesn't follow Jesus, their suffering is just an end in itself. Whereas for us who are Christians who follow Jesus, our suffering should lead us to following Jesus even more closely. It bears fruit in our lives. How many times have you seen someone who has lost a child or lost their spouse, who loves Jesus and says, you know, it's really hard. It's really difficult, but God is teaching me. God is close to me in this time. And the Bible says that he draws near to the brokenhearted, right? Right? This is the amazing thing about us who follow Jesus, who choose to follow Jesus. Our suffering is not in vain. It's not empty. It's not worthless. Our suffering should and does produce fruit. But the sufferings of the unrepentant is empty. Philippians 3.8, Paul says, I consider all things a loss so that I might gain Christ. Right? He's writing this from jail, okay? He's writing this from jail where he's beaten and broken and punched in the face every day, right? And he says, I consider all of this just loss because I get to gain Jesus. And it's in that book, that very same book, where he says, For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. This is the amazing thing. Suffering in the life of a Christian produces change, or it should, when we, see, when we are acting and living and keeping with repentance. And lastly, I'll say this from verses 12 to 14, when it talks about the kings of the earth are assembled against God in the valley of Armageddon, in the great day of God, the Almighty, verses 14. What happens when we allow idolatry to lead us off into rebellion against God and when we, uh, <clears throat> when we become blind to God's justice and our suffering does not produce change, we actually get to the place where we take joy in separating ourselves from God. We are so full of bitterness. We are so full of sin. We are so full of just contempt towards God and anger towards God that we actually take joy in separation from God. This is an extremely sad thing to see. And we see it, right? People who, who use media all the time to just, to just throw out their, their obscenities over God and just cursing him and, and standing there and saying, I, I stand here and I, 
immediately completely deny and I blaspheme the Holy Spirit. There are people who are doing this in this world and they take great joy. They say, God, I don't want you anymore. Let's cut ties. It's all over. Just stay away from me. And that's what we see here to these people that they're gathered here. These armies are gathered in this valley of Armageddon because they want to end it. They want to say, God, just we'll, we'll fight against you if we have to. I, they, they just say, I don't want you anymore. If we have to come against you violently, we will, and we will take great joy in it. This is the attitude of people who are unrepentant. And ultimately, this leads to wrath. This leads to wrath, God's wrath being poured out on these people. See, being unrepentant keeps us from a life transformed by the gospel. It does. Being unrepentant keeps us from a life transformed by the gospel. Now, the scene seems hopeless, and it is, but there is hope. There's hope in the midst of this scene. In the midst of all this tragedy, in in all of what seems like a really heavy thing for us to digest, guess what John does when he's writing? I don't know if you noticed. Did you did you notice in your Bible, maybe some of you have this, where verse 15 is written in red? Right? In the middle of all of this, Jesus shows up. John can't help it, right? He can't help it. Even when he's, he's saying this is going to be wrath and this is going to be God's wrath poured out, the fullness of his wrath poured out on the ungodly, he's like, I can't help it. I've got to put it in there. I've got to say something from Jesus. I've got to reveal the risen Christ. And I'm thankful that he does because this gives us hope for the church, for the people who are reading this in the ancient, in, in the um, <clears throat> Middle East as they're reading this. Jesus shows up in the midst of this tragic story. Let's read verse 15. It says, behold, I am coming like a thief. And get this, blessed. Jesus brings blessing into a tragic situation. Blessed is the one who stays awake, keeping his garments on, that he may not go about naked and be seen exposed. We've already seen what happens when we are unrepentant. This is what happens when we are repentant. This is what happens when we are repentant. First of all, Jesus shows up, as I said in verse 15. Two things quickly about repentance that are are very crucial and important. Repentance gives us the right perspective. Repentance gives us the right perspective. John's, or Jesus through John is writing here and says, blessed is the one who stays awake. Stays awake. Now, in, when you're awake, when you are awake, you see what's going on around you, right? You ever been in college before and people are taking Sharpie markers and writing on people's faces when they're asleep, right? Am I the only one who maybe has seen something like that happen? Okay. Am I the only one who's ever done something like that? Uh, that's probably the question. Uh, <clears throat> I guess you don't have to be in college to see that happening. Uh, <clears throat> but when we're asleep, we are totally unaware of what's going on around us. When we're awake, we see. When we are awake, we see. Repentance gives us the right perspective. And that's what Jesus is saying here. Stay awake. Stay alert. See. And how do we see? How do we see what's going on around us? We see through God's word and through the Holy Spirit illuminating us, leading us. And when we are given the right perspective, we understand we are given the right perspective on sin. We see sin for what it really is. You ever had someone come up to you and say, man, I'm sorry I did that, but really, you know what? The reason why that happened was because so-and-so did this to me, or you know what? That person really made me angry, so I, I lashed out at you. Just making excuses, right? That's not a heart of repentance. That's not a heart of repentance at all. When we minimize sin, when we make excuses, even some of us will go as far to make excuses towards God. God, why did you make me this way? That's why I'm acting this way. 
right? Is that truly a repentant heart? Is that truly a heart that understands what repentance is and what sin does? We have a wrong view of what sin does to us. Now, the Bible is very clear. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10, this is what it says. For godly grief produces repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. There is such a thing as godly sorrow, and there is such a thing as worldly sorrow. And there is a difference between the two. Some people are simply sorry that they got caught, right? Remember Tiger Woods? Basically, all he was saying was, I'm sorry I got caught. How all that stuff came up about all the women that he was seeing and all the, th- the people that he was sleeping around with, how it came up was that he had a car crash and got in a fight with his wife. An investigation led to further and further, further things, and then, guys, I'm, I'm sorry I got caught, really is what he's saying. Because he's not truly repentant. He would have kept doing it, right? And, and the same is true for you and I, Right? If we don't have a healthy perspective on what, or even a a huge perspective on on what sin does to us, that it's going to lead us off and lead us into wrath, if we are not understanding what sin is going to do to us, guys, we're just going to keep on doing it. We're just going to keep on hurting that person we love. We're going to keep on cheating. We're going to keep on lying. We're going to keep on being faithless. We need to understand what this sin is doing to the other person. And most importantly, we have to also understand what this sin is doing to God. Repentance is not just horizontal, it is vertical. Get this, David in Psalm 51.4, when, he, is, when he, he says this to God, he says, God against you and you alone have I sinned. Okay, a little background on that psalm. David wrote that song, or that psalm, after he had committed, after he had, <laughs> after he had brought a woman who was married into his bed and then sent her husband off to get to the front of the lines where he knew for sure he would get killed. So David's sin was not just towards God, it affected so many other people. So why is David saying this? Well, first of all, if we do not realize our sin and the consequences it has between us and God, we will never understand the consequences between us and other people. In order for repentance to to work itself between us, we must understand that we are in grave sin before a holy God who is perfect and righteous and just in everything that he does. John Piper says this, repenting, repentant, repenting, sorry, means experiencing a change of mind that now sees God as true and beautiful and worthy of all our praise and all our obedience. And secondly, I'll say this about repentance. I'm going to try and wrap this up really quickly. The right perspective on sin. The right perspective on sin and on the God who gave himself for us should lead us to take the right action. Repentance is so much more than just acknowledging your sin. It's doing something about it. It's doing something about it. Jesus says, keeping his garments on. He talks about nakedness. And in the Bible, spiritual nakedness is basically directed towards people who have made other things their God. He talks about Israel as jumping into bed, spiritually so, with other gods. And Jesus is here telling his people, he's saying to them, keep your clothes on. Keep your clothes on. We must be led to the right action towards and we must confess our sin. We have to confess our sin. Psalm 32, 5 says, I acknowledge my sin to you. This is David writing. And I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to you, to the Lord, and you will forget, you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Now, here's the thing about confession. A lot of people are saying, well, I don't need to confess. 
I don't need to share with those things about those things. But here's, here's the amazing thing about confession. You will never be truly known until you confess or reveal who, who you are. Someone who lives in confession, someone who is, is confession, confessing their sins, people know already who they are and what they're about, right? If I'm not confessing my sin, I, for example, I can't receive true love as I would understand it, right? Because, you know, someone could come to me and I'll use, my, I'll use this example. Someone could come to me and say, Josh, you know, you play the guitar really well. But if I'm not, if I haven't confessed, if I haven't shared about who I am, how do I take that when I know myself? If someone comes to me and says, Josh, you're a great person. I really appreciate you. I, I hold that back, right? Because I'm like, well, if they really knew me, if they really knew what I did just yesterday, or if they really knew what I was just thinking, they wouldn't say that about me. But when it's completely open and when it's there, when we are brought to repentance, guys, it's sweet because we can be known and fully known. We can show ourselves to people. We're the church. We're not people who walk around with halos around our heads. We are misfits. We are broken. We should acknowledge that. Why are we trying to cover it up? This is what confession does to us, and not just confession to, of sin, but here's, here's one of the things I want to really, I want you to see. It's not just confession, but killing and walking away from sin. You have to kill the sin. You cannot be indifferent towards it. You can't just say, well, you know, I, I, I struggle with, um, <clears throat> I, I, you can't just say to yourself, you know, I, I struggle with pornography, for example. But you know what? I'll just keep browsing. I'm bored. I'll keep on the internet, keep doing those things. You have to kill it. Cut it at its source. You've heard how we say before, for those of you, whatever it might be, dogs or cats that you like, that pet that we keep, right? And we say, well, God, I'm, I'm sorry that I, I let this pet take over my life. I'll try to do better next time. But we still keep the pet alive. We have to take a gun and shoot it. We do. And bury it and burn it and kick it over and over and over and over again until we get it out of our lives. See, not killing the sin reveals that you don't own the sin. The sin owns you. If you do not kill it, You are a servant to it. Colossians 3, 5 to 10 says, put, talks about putting to death what is earthly in you. The lust, the things that you are wrestling with. Charles Spurgeon says, there is no repentance where a man can talk lightly of sin, much less where he can talk, speak tenderly and lovingly about it. You have to go to an extreme measure because that's what sin does to us. It goes to an extreme measure. And then, not only in walking away from sin, you have to walk towards God. You have to run towards him. Only then will you see God becoming more and more real. Guys, I gotta tell you this. There are so many people who come up to me or who, and even myself, I ask that question. How come I can't see God working in my life? How come I can't see him at work? How come he's not speaking to me? How come he's not leading me well are you living in repentance are you putting aside your sin are you killing it are you running away from it and are you running towards God Psalm 1 verses 1 and 2 says this blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked nor stands in the way of sinners nor sits in a seat of scoffers but his delight is in the law of the Lord and on his law he meditates day and night Repentance leads to the right perspective, which leads to the right actions, which results in this transformation. That's what repentance is about. J.I. Packer says, repentance means turning from as much as you, as you know of your sin to give as much of you know of yourself to as much as you know of God. And as our knowledge grows at these three points, so our practice of repentance will, has to be enlarged. 
Repentance is absolutely necessary for a life transformed by the gospel. It's not just something you do once. It is a continual day after day after day. When you wake up, when you go to sleep, check yourself. Be brought before God in repentance. Acknowledge your sin before him. Bring your sin to other people whom you've hurt. And work the most that you can to try and kill that sin. Guys, I'm not saying that you will never sin again. I, don't, don't mishear me. There are some sins, there are addictions, there are things that, that just keep rearing their ugly heads. But here's the question. The question is not, have you sinned, but have you changed? Have you changed? Are you just go- keep going around in that cycle? Or are you allowing God to work out fruits of repentance that show faith in him, that you're moving towards him and man, that beat me down again, but you know what? I'm going to get back up and get in the fight and go even harder this time. Don't let sin take root. In the end, this is what it comes down to. When Jesus shows up, our lives are transformed. When Jesus shows up, our lives are transformed. See, this is the gospel, guys. We've read this passage today about about wrath, God's wrath poured out on these people. And did they make it through? They suffered God's wrath. But the gospel is this. Jesus suffered God's wrath to transform you. Stop trying to go through it yourself. Stop trying to say, I can make it through. I can do this on my own. Only in Jesus will you experience true repentance when you see what he's done for you. Jesus suffered God's wrath to transform us. We cannot suffer God's wrath and be transformed. Only Jesus can. This is the gospel. Let's be a church. We've been here for four years. Let's be a church that acknowledges our sin before God. And if, if people look at Centerpoint Church, let them say of Centerpoint Church, they are a repentant bunch. They have the right view of sin. They have the right view of God. And they're doing the best they can to kill the sin, putting it to death in them and moving towards this God and delighting in him, enjoying him. This is a great day. God has given you life this day. He has saved you this day. Let's be excited about what he's doing and let that just bear fruit keeping with repentance in our lives. Let's be brought to repentance before our God. Let us pray as we close this morning. God, it's in you alone that we can acknowledge these things. I, I, can't, I can't save anyone. I can't give them any words of wisdom except what you, God, have given to us in your word. So Jesus, please, I pray that you'd plant that seed in us that keeps and bears fruit of repentance. God, that our faith would be shown. That God, when we have faith in Jesus, that will ultimately lead us to repent of our sin. And not just repentance one time, but continually, day after day after day, acknowledging our sin and being brought before you. And God, may this just be, bring us to a, an amazing wonder of grace. Oh God, we need you. We need you so badly. We confess to you, Jesus, our sin. And we pray that you would lead us in the way everlasting. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.